Welcome to the Pro-Life Team Podcast. I'm Jacob Barr. I'm here with Donna, and we're going to be talking about some, some marketing spin that has that is promoting false beliefs in the medical world surrounding abortion, medicated abortion, abortion pill reversal. And so we want to address these false beliefs and promote the truth, promote, promote the, the healthy decisions and promote medical medical um, ideas and thoughts that should be that should completely dispel some of these false beliefs that are being promoted and spun into into our society. Hi Donna, I am so glad that you're on here. Would you introduce yourself as if you were talking to a small group of pregnancy clinic directors, uh, pregnancy clinic medical teams, um, pro-life friends? Sure. Um, thanks, Jacob. I'm Dr. Donna Harrison. I'm a board-certified OBGYN, and I'm the executive, uh, the <laughs> chief executive officer of the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. We're about 7,000 around the country who um, do not use killing human beings as a therapeutic option. And that's what binds us together. So do-it-yourself abortions and the danger associated with do-it-yourself abortions. Uh, let's talk about that for a moment. So, so for decades, a major pro-abortion talking point has been that banning abortion would force women back to the back alleys, risking their lives through unsafe do-it-yourself abortions. Today, however, pro-abortion advocates are discouraging fellow pro-choicers from using that talking point. Instead, saying that self-managed abortions are safe, what role has the uh, proliferation of medication abortion played in this transition? And can you speak to the history of that development? Yeah, boy, that's a great question. And let's talk a little bit about what self-managed abortion is, and then I'll, I'll kind of branch out and, and address some of the other issues that you brought in at the beginning. So what self-managed abortion is, is using dangerous abortion drugs like mifeprex and mesoprostol without ever seeing a physician. And the truth of it is that there is no way that a woman can get adequate informed consent or know what her risks are without seeing a physician. Why? Because she doesn't know how far along she is. Half the women that present to an OB-GYN's office for prenatal care have to have their due date changed because an early ultrasound shows that they're not quite as far pregnant as they thought they were, or they're much more pregnant than they thought they were. In fact, half of women have to have that due date changed. So what does that mean for a self-managed abortion? If you are, let's say, three weeks after your missed period, so that's seven weeks pregnant, your chances of needing surgery are about one in 20, okay? So of 20 women that do a self-managed abortion at seven weeks, you know, about one out of that 20 will need to go to the ER for hemorrhage or for retained tissue to get, to get the tissue taken out so that they don't get infected. The problem is if you are just five weeks further along, if you're at 13 weeks, you got a one out of three chance you got a 33% chance that you are going to have to have surgery to complete this abortion for hemorrhage or tissue left inside. How is a woman going to know that if she doesn't have an ultrasound? She won't. And what's even worse is that one out of 50 women in this country, when they get pregnant, the pregnancy doesn't plant in the, in the womb. It plants in the tube. That's called an ectopic pregnancy. Women die from rupturing ectopic pregnancies and the mifeprex and mesoprostol, the chemical abortion does not treat ectopic pregnancies. It doesn't cause the baby to stop growing. So the placental tissue will keep growing and the woman will have pain and bleeding, which is what she's being told. Well, a mifeprex abortion has pain and bleeding. So she'll just think it's a normal part of a mifeprex abortion when in fact, She's bleeding to death internally. We've had women who have died. They've called their doc and the doc said, oh, you know, honey, lay down and take a Tylenol. And, and they bled to death because they didn't make it to the ear in time because their ectopic pregnancy ruptures and then they don't make it. So 
this is really, this is significant stuff here. Even if you didn't even think about the human being inside the womb, if you just thought about women, drug-induced abortion is a lousy way to do an abortion for a woman. She's alone. She doesn't know her complications. She doesn't know how far along she is. You know, it's, it's awful. And there's two more aspects to this whole self-induced abortion thing. One of them is she's going to deliver that baby who, and she's been told this is just a blob of tissue and she's going to see a baby with a head and arms and legs and eyes and, you know, looking at her. And, and this, is, this is a real psychological trauma that women are not prepared for, especially if they've been lied to and have been told this is a blob of tissue. The other thing that is really important, and we'll probably get to it at the end in more detail, but if a woman is Rh negative, let's say she has A negative blood or O negative blood, and she is pregnant, then every time she separates from her baby, whether that is a birth or an abortion or a miscarriage, every time she is supposed to get a drug called Rogam. And what Rogam does is Rogam helps to make sure that her body doesn't mount an immune response to the next baby. And this is particularly personal for me because my husband lost two sisters at birth from RH negative, RH incompatibility disease. His, he was fine, but he sensitized his mother. You know, it, it, that's not his fault. It's just, that's what happens when you have a baby who's, you know, when you're an RH negative mom. He sensitized his mother so that the next pregnancy, she had a baby who was born, born dead at term because the baby had no blood because her body mounted an immune response to that baby's blood. She, he had a, another sister who had a 95% exchange transfusion at birth. And then he had another sister who made it to about 32 weeks and she died and his mom almost died. So RH negative disease is not something to, to laugh about. It's serious. And we've experienced it in our own family. Like I said, my husband's experienced it up close and personal. That RH negative disease was almost completely wiped out with the advent of Rogam. But you have to have Rogam at the time that the mom separates from the baby. Because if, you, if she doesn't get it at that time, then she sensitizes her immune system. And then she mounts an immune response against the baby after that. So it's a really serious problem. And people aren't thinking about that when they're doing do-it-yourself abortions. And the abortion industry is completely ignoring the realities of these risks for women. In fact, if you go on these websites that allow you to order abortion pills without any prescription, without any doctor's intervention, they'll say things like, it's 100% safe. There's no complications, which anytime anybody tells you any intervention is 100% safe with no complications, you better believe they're smoking something because it's not that every medical intervention has the potential for complications. Now, there are things that are safer than others, but we know that Mifeprex is not a safe drug. Again, you've got, you've got one out of 20 women who are ending up in the ER needing surgery for hemorrhage and retained tissue. That's not safe. So the whole, the whole myth that the abortion industry tries to spin is Mifeprex is safe. They have to say that because the FDA can only allow drugs on the market that are safe. And what we have been saying for the last, since 2000 is this is not a safe drug. And, and there's reasons why the, the FDA restricted the use of the drug to certain conditions and certain gestational ages to minimize the dangers that are inherent in the use of chemical abortions. So going back to what you mentioned about the, um, the RH factor, uh, what, what's the normal procedure? So when someone has a pregnancy and they, the blood, they, you know, their blood type is known and then the blood, is the blood type of the baby tested or how is that discovered? And then based on the results or, or is it given to every mom perhaps based on her blood type? It's given to every mom who is RH negative, unless she for sure um, has no exposure to anyone with RH positive blood. But we just simply assume that she, uh, that an RH negative woman needs Rogam at the time of being separated from her baby. 
And so when it comes to, so if a mom has RH negative blood, I mean, I'm not RH, is that what it's called? Is RH negative or how is RH it? Negative. It's like, it's like O negative or A negative okay. or B negative. If that's her blood type, then she's RH negative and she okay. needs Rogam at the time of separating from her baby, whether it's a miscarriage or an abortion or a, or a birth, or even if she gets in a motor vehicle accident and has some bleeding and she's pregnant, we give RH, uh, we give Rogam to prevent sensitization. Anytime there's a possibility that some of the fetal cells, some of the baby cells would get into her circulation. So if a woman is experiencing a surgical abortion um, and she has RH negative blood, Rogam would be needed for her body to not build up that immune system or that those antibodies, I suppose, or whatever that would be considered. Um, yes. In order to then, when she has a future pregnancy, uh, for her body to not, yeah, have that defense built up towards a, another blood type, I suppose. Yes, that's correct. That's right. Okay. Very interesting. And 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 so, does that include? When, so if a mom is you know, when it, how, at what age of the pregnancy does that become a concern? Or is it a concern from fairly early on? Or is it mostly a concern from some point in the middle on? Yeah, well, safety-wise, we used to give it to, to moms at any gestational age. Because even though the baby's blood volume is low, there is still a chance that the baby's blood can mix with the mom's blood, which is more likely during a surgical abortion than it would be during a miscarriage. Because what happens mm -hmm. with a miscarriage is that the baby dies and then the blood vessels kind of contract and there isn't, there isn't as much mixing. But even with a miscarriage, anything beyond you know, eight, nine weeks, we would give Rogam. And in fact, that is actually the recommendation. And so it makes even more sense with the surgical abortion because you have a lot of bleeding with the surgical abortion. You're scraping off that tissue from the womb, you're opening up the mom's blood vessels. You're certainly, you know, spilling baby's blood as well. So there's a lot more potential there. Um, but even with the chemical abortion, you have the fact that, that you have a possibility of the baby's blood getting in the mom's system and the further in pregnancy she is, the higher the chance that that happens. Hmm. So another question that I have uh, pre-prepared here is, so pro-abortion advocates, have claimed that medication abortion is safer than Tylenol. Where do they get this data and what's wrong with that talking point? Well, they get the data from thin air. They probably get it from uh, you know, their, their media spin people, but they don't get it from reality because you have, like I said, one out of 20 women early in pregnancy, early in pregnancy, at least one out of 20 women end up in the ER. That's you don't have one out of 20 people taking Tylenol ending up in the ER needing surgery. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. Okay. So they make up these numbers out of thin air, hoping that it's a great talking point, but it doesn't have to have any reality behind it. So just, you know, understand you're talking marketing. It, this is all marketing speak. It, it's mm -hmm. not, it's not real speak. So the other thing that you need to know about abortion complications is that Abortion complications are not systematically tracked. I'll give you a great example. The FDA in 2016, when they extended the limit for medication abortion, they said you can use a drug-induced abortion like Mifeprex originally only up till seven weeks of pregnancy. That means three weeks after the missed period. In 2016, they said, oh, you can use it all the way up to 10 weeks. And by the way, we're not going to track anymore. The only thing that the manufacturer is responsible for now is reporting deaths. And the only way that the manufacturer gets to know deaths is if the abortionist knows about the death. And a lot of times the abortionist doesn't know about the death. Why can I say that? Because I and a whole team of doctors from the American Association of Pro-Life ob -GYNs reviewed every single adverse event report that was submitted to the FDA from 2000 to 2019. And we saw several times, multiple times with a death that the abortionist didn't know about the death until they read about it in the newspaper. Mm. That means the abortionist is not being contacted when this woman dies. Okay, so if they don't know about it, how can they report it to Danco? And if Danco doesn't know about it, 
Danco is the manufacturer of Mifeprex. How can Danco report it to the FDA? See, there's no requirement. Excuse me. <laughs> Let me try that again. No worries. There's no requirement that doctors report complications to the FDA. The only requirement that was put forth by the FDA was that the manufacturer report complications to the FDA. Well, the doctors aren't gonna know. The doctors in the emergency room is, are not gonna know what Danco's uh, address is and why in the world would they report to Danco? They have, they have no idea that that kind of reporting even needs to happen. Now, could they report it to the FDA? They could but they're not gonna think about it. And again, right now the FDA is not routinely requiring anything but deaths to be reported and only that requirement from the manufacturer and not from physicians who are treating the complications. So this was another thing that came out of our analysis of the adverse event reports. We looked at who actually did the care for women that had complications. Less than half the time, the abortionists did the care. Most of the time, it was the ER doctor who did the care for the woman who had a complication. And women are telling their ER doctors things that aren't true. Why do we say that? Well, the abortion industry is recommending that women not tell their doctors they've had a Mifeprex abortion. But the data that we got was from known Mifeprex abortions. Okay? And even there, there were times when in the adverse event report, the abortionist would say, the woman did not disclose to the ER doctor that she had a Mifeprex abortion. Well, I've also been on a team of researchers that have looked at the Medicaid database. And we've looked at women who have had, who have purchased uh, uh, Mifeprex and Mesoprostol, the two drugs for the abortion, and then their subsequent complication rate in the ER. And it turns out 60% of the time, that's over half the time, Women in the ER, after purchasing Mifeprex and Mesoprostol, get coded as a spontaneous abortion. So that doesn't even show up in reports looking at Mifeprex complications. So there's a couple of uh, abortion industry reports that say, oh, well, you know, it's only 8% of women that end up in the ER with a serious complication. Well, the fact is that's 40% of the actual number. It's actually double that based on our analysis of the uh, Medicaid data. So what you have in the abortion industry, industry side is we're not looking. So because we're not looking, we think that there's no complications because our eyes are closed and our ears are closed and there's no systematic way of tracking. That has that's to really, change. That yeah, that's really change. good to, to see. So to try and recap, what I, just to verify, so the ER, is not informing the abortion clinic doctor because it's they don't have a requirement, it sounds like, for them to, but especially if the abortion, if the ER doctor was not even told it was an abortion, right. it, they may be told it was something else, which is right. why, and so they might be getting a, um, a different story there at the ER. And then the abortion, so by the abortion clinic doctor not knowing, they're not able to inform Danco, the pharmaceutical company, right. And then if Danco is not informed, they can't then pass it to the FDA. That's correct. Um, and so then those numbers are just simply missing. Um, so it sounds like there's requirements, but the actual doctor providing the care, like the ER, the ER doctor is not included in the requirement set. It, it well, sounds like that's the what, <laughs> what's happening. There used to be requirements. It used to be from 2000 to 2016 that Danco was required to report complications. Okay. They were required to okay. report all complications. However, in 2016, FDA said, oh, we don't want to know about complications anymore. We just want to know when a woman dies. So there's been no complication reporting or very minimal complication reporting since 2016. And what makes this even worse is that the FDA uh, did allowed for the um, use of Mifeprex without a physician visit during COVID. And when asked why they did that, they said, oh, well, we reviewed the, F the uh, adverse event reports from 2020 and there weren't many. And it's like, how could you say that? You didn't even require reporting. And now you're saying 
that you reviewed the, mm. the events that, that were not required to be reported. I mean, it, it, you got to laugh or you cry because that is such a disingenuous thing for the FDA to say. And, and yet that's, that's what they published as the rationale for why they thought it was okay for women to get these drugs, this powerful chemical abortion drug, without knowing whether it's safe or not. Because there is no way to know how these women are doing when there's no systematic reporting. Mm. Well, that's, I'm really glad you raised that and exp explained it because that's really important for people to understand and that there is, yeah, when it comes to reporting missing and not having, yeah, just not, yeah, and then they're pulling, yeah, but then to then claim stats from the data that was not based on report, you know, requirements, require, required reporting, that, that's, that speaks volumes to the dishonesty and the false beliefs that are being yeah. portrayed um, based on based on these uh, numbers. Um, what, what dangers are associated with no ultrasound telemedicine abortion? Okay, so the same dangers that we talked about with do-it-yourself abortions, telemedicine is a kind of a do-it-yourself abortion. So you can't do an ultrasound over the internet. You just can't do it. You have to be physically in a place where the person holding the ultrasound transducer is physically on your belly or you know, doing it intravaginally. So there's just no way that you can tell without an ultrasound. And an ultrasound is critically important for informed consent, for knowing exactly how far along the baby is, and for knowing exactly where the baby is, for ruling out ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But even worse than that, you know, Jacob, you have no idea who is standing behind this computer screen. The potential for abusers and pimps to be involved in this process is huge. So even yeah. if I were talking to you, you don't know whether somebody's holding a gun to my head right now. You have no way of screening for abuse. And that's, that's horrible for women who are being sex trafficked. If you look at the studies, there was a study by Laura Lederer where she interviewed women who had come out of sex trafficking. The single most common place that they interacted with the medical profession, Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. Okay. So they were being taken in for abortions and Planned Parenthood wasn't reporting. They weren't screening for coercion or if they were screening, they were ignoring it. They weren't re reporting things. There was actually a, a, a couple of studies that I looked at um, one of whom reported a 13-year-old girl in Atlanta, Georgia, who's coming in for a second abortion. And finally, this got to the level of the authorities. And they asked the Planned Parenthood worker, why didn't you report this? And she said, well, she didn't look like she was being abused. I'm like, I was amazed to read that. This is statutory rape. Okay, the girl's being raped. And you say she didn't look abused? 13 with the second pregnancy, hello, you know, mm. it's this kind of, of, I don't get it stuff that is, is part and parcel of the danger to women from the abortion industry. And it's part and parcel of the dangers that are multiplied when you have telemedicine dispensing. Further, if I would order this drug, you would have no idea whether I was the one that was actually going to use the drug. So I may order this drug and I may use it to take care of a rival's pregnancy. Or a guy can order it, have, have a girl sit in, he can order it and, you know, take care of his herd. In fact, the online ordering that we talked about before, the, the 70 plus different websites where you can order, some of them offer a bulk discount. Who's going to get a bulk discount? Pimps and abusers. And there's been cases all across the country of men who've been prosecuted for slipping abortion drugs into their girlfriend's drinks, into their girlfriend's mm. yogurt. Okay. This is the potential for abuse is enormous. This is not empowerment for women. This is making women very, very vulnerable, especially to, to reproductive coercion. And, and I think that that's part of the danger of separating 
the woman from someone who can actually screen her for coercion, know how far along she is, actually do some kind of medical care. What you get with the uh, do-it-yourself or the telemed abortion is, baby, you're on your own. You have nobody who knows about you and you have nobody who cares about you. All they care about is getting your money and giving you the drug. This sounds more like drug dealing than it does like medical care. Hmm. Going back to what that, that first that first story you mentioned, uh, a 13 year old with a second pregnancy and the Planned Parenthood person said that it didn't look like abuse. I'm trying to wrap my head around that. So <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> it, it's just, um, I, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't, I can't even imagine a place where that would not be abuse. Like, it's not just like, it's, it's like 99.99% abuse likelihood. It, uh, there, there's not even, a, there's not even a good, you know, not even a small percent chance that that's not abuse because of the, <laughs> yeah. And it, it was the first pregnancy, did the first pregnancy end in abortion? And that, this was the, per, this that's was my that, understanding. That's, that's my understanding. understanding. It was the second yeah, abortion. What, so, by definition, when you have a pregnancy in a girl that's 13, that's statutory rape, okay? That's rape. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the covering up of statutory rape and the systematic covering up of it and the covering up of sex trafficking, the aiding and abetting of sex traffickers. And this is a, a horrible connection with the abortion industry. So the abortion industry aids and abets sex traffickers and abusers to, you know, to continue their abuse of women. It doesn't intervene. It doesn't bring in law enforcement. It covers it up. And that's what we have to remember about, you know, the, the underage girls that are getting abortions. This covers for the abuser. This covers for the rapist. Wow. I wonder, and it seems like there's going to be um, a level of correlation or a high percent or, or, or a percent of correlation between abortion and abuse based on why people choose abortion in several scenarios. Um, do you know of any studies that have tried to link, you know, that common, you know, co you know try to link abuse with a, a an abortion decision or someone who is going in that direction? Well, there's a really, really good study by Laura Lederer, it's a few years ago, interviewing women who have come out of sex trafficking. And again, most of them had interactions with Planned Parenthood. And, and so you've got the, the whole continuation of abuse. It wasn't Planned Parenthood that led them out of the abusive situation. It's Planned Parenthood that aided and abetted the abusive situation. So when you look at reasons women abort, it's actually will break your heart. If th there's a couple of good studies, that even on the Guttmacher website, you know, search reasons women abort. Things like, I didn't have any money. I've got a couple kids and, and I don't have a job. My boyfriend's gone. My husband didn't want this child. I was told I'd be kicked out of my family. This does not sound like women's empowerment. This sounds like pressure, incredible pressure. Like one of the women even said, Oh, I was free to choose anything I wanted as long as I aborted. So it's this kind of cynical, you know, calling this a woman's choice when in fact she's not empowered to make any other choice. And, and I think that's part of what we need to be talking about is women who are choosing abortion are seeing abortion as a solution to a social problem. And maybe we could work together to solve those social problems so women don't feel pressured into abortion because most of women, a vast majority of women are pressured into that abortion. Yeah, it, it seems like there's this plague or you know, this coercion, coercion from, from, from maybe from parents, maybe from the boyfriend, coercion maybe from culture to coerce a woman and thinking that this is her only choice or she must do this. Um, and, and, and that, and that's starkly, it's, it's very much, um, it contrasts with when a woman is abortion minded and she talks at a, talks to someone at a pregnancy clinic, 80, 85% will change their mind right. and, you know, choose to defend the life within them and to have that baby. Um, 
And so that just speaks to the the power of coercion versus the you know the the, the beauty of of listening and providing care and helping yeah. you know helping support women. And it literally is like evil versus good when it comes to how this is playing out. And if you look at it from you know, if you look at it from above and try and see, you know, one group is promoting death and one group is promoting life. And that woman can be supported in choosing life. It's, you know, 85% are changing their mind from death to life. And why? Because they're, because the pregnancy care centers breathe out hope. You know what? The key for abortion is despair. And the, the abortion clinics breed on that despair man, you can't do this now. You know, this is going to ruin your life. All these despairing kinds of visions, whereas the pregnancy care center says, we'll walk with you. Yeah, you can do this. And there's a whole support group that we can provide you with. And we'll walk with you through this process. You know, this is something I learned in medical school. It's just amazing. But women don't get pregnant by themselves. They actually have it's in a context. It's in a, a context that is meant to be a supportive, permanent relationship. It's, you know, for the sake of the child, for the sake of the mom. You know, so when women are abandoned, they're in a situation where they're tempted to despair. And you just said it. The pregnancy care centers, they give hope, they give, they give community, they give themselves to someone. And, and that's what women need. They need support. They need help. They need economic help. They need real help. They need economic and, and job help. They need training. And like, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, our APLOG office is in a pregnancy care center. And I have seen men's ministries. I've seen, um, you know, women come in, they've given diapers and clothes and supported and training programs and teaching programs. You know, it's wonderful. And the whole thing is, this is this is the heart of mostly women saying, "You're part of our sisterhood. Let's let's support you. Let's celebrate the life that you have." And it's just amazing the difference when you celebrate life. That's what the women are looking for. They're looking for hope. Yeah. Well, that's good. So the next set of questions I have uh, speaks to miscarriage treatment in relation mm -hmm. to elective abortion. So. Yeah. Pro-abortion advocates uh, are claiming that pro-life laws are hindering doctors' ability to treat miscarriage. And so the question is, do they? And what's the difference between miscarriage treatment and elective abortion? Well, this is probably the most amazing bit of spin I have ever seen in my life. There is a profound difference between miscarriage treatment and abortion. That profound difference is in a miscarriage, the baby's already died. And in an elective abortion, the baby's alive, but somebody wants that baby dead. Okay, so an elective abortion is a procedure or drugs done for the express and explicit purpose of producing a dead baby. Let me give you an example that will clearly illustrate this. Let's take an abortion of a baby who's 30 weeks. Okay, mom's baby's 30 weeks along. And that baby lives after the abortion. It's called a failed abortion. The separation of the baby and the mom did not fail to occur. The mom is no longer pregnant. But what failed to occur is the baby failed to die. And this was made explicitly mm -hmm. clear during the partial birth abortion hearings before the U.S. Supreme Court. The justices asked the abortionists, well, if you have the baby partway out of the birth canal before you plunge the scissors into their head, why don't you just take the baby all the way out? And the abortionist answered, because the purpose of an abortion is to not have a live birth, i.e. the purpose of an abortion is a dead baby. That's the product you pay the abortionist to produce. That's very, very different when the baby's already died. And what you do with miscarriage care is you take the baby out, and you take the placenta out. And in, in, if you at all possibly can, you take the baby out in a way that the mom and the dad, the brothers and sisters and grandparents, grandparents can hold the baby 
and grieve the baby because this baby, even though this baby died, this baby was a part of that family, a, a grandson, a granddaughter, a brother, a sister, a son, a daughter. And being able to grieve that baby is very important for the healing process of the family. So those of us who deal with miscarriage care know that. We try to be respectful of the relationship and the baby's body when it comes out in a state where, if at all possible, we can allow that family to grieve like they will. And it, it helps to hold the baby. Versus an abortion, especially second trimester abortions, the baby's brought out in pieces. It guarantees that the baby dies and there is no body for the parents to hold. So it's a, mm. a, a abortion, a people that do abortions and elective abortion altogether is a complete denial of the humanity of that human being in the womb. And we know that there's a human being in the womb. Every mom knows it. You know, talk to women who've miscarried. They, they, they name their baby. Some moms treasure the baby pictures that they had. You know, there's a, there's a, whole, uh, a, a whole set of ways that you take care of miscarriage. Again, being respectful of the grief that the parents go through. That's all denied in an elective abortion. And the procedures for elective abortion are different too. So for, for someone to say, you can't get miscarriage care is borders on delusional. There is not a, a law in the entire country, and I've reviewed them as, as have other lawyer colleagues of mine have reviewed them. There's a law in the entire country that prevents miscarriage care, that prevents ectopic care, that prevents separating the mom and the baby to save the mother's life. Not one law in the entire country. And yet the abortion industry is fear-mongering. Oh my goodness, we're not going to be able to treat miscarriages. If your doctor can't tell the difference between a living baby and a dead baby, you might want another doctor. So those of us who care about living babies and can tell the difference between a living baby and a dead baby, we don't intentionally go in and kill that baby. That's, that's not a medical procedure. That's mm -hmm. using surgery to solve a social problem. We don't kill human beings to solve social problems. That's, that's part of the Hippocratic Oath. So the Hippocratic Oath itself that doctors used to take and that formed the foundation of medical ethics for the last 2,500 years, the Hippocratic Oath says explicitly, I will not give a person a poison to produce euthanasia. And in the same way, I won't do an abortion. Neither will I refer for them. That's what the Hippocratic Oath says. And that's the reason that you can trust your doctor is because they have vowed by all that they hold sacred that they will not kill you or your unborn child or grandma. You know, that, that's an important part. So one thing I would encourage every listener here is the next time you go into your doctor's office, ask them, hey, doc, did you take the Hippocratic Oath? And if they say yes, they, well, what oath did you take? Do you have it somewhere? Because a lot of the Hippocratic Oaths today are not the Hippocratic Oath. They're things like, wow. well, I vow to save the planet or I vow to use medical resources wisely. That's not the oath. And that provides no protection for the patient. The Hippocratic mm. Oath is the protection, is the reason that patients can trust their doctor because it protects the patient from the things that the doctor could be tempted to do. Hmm. So as a follow-up, since, since um, Dobbs or the overturning of Roe, we've seen stories flying around about women in pro-life states finding themselves unable to reach, receive treatment for their miscarriages. So these, you know, we've heard the stories of these. What could be behind all these stories? And what are your thoughts on why this is happening? Well, I, first of all, it's very hard to know the details of a story without looking at the medical record. So mm -hmm. anybody can say anything about anything. And without looking at the medical record, you have no way of knowing whether that woman actually was having a miscarriage or not. So, and we aren't privileged to the, privy to the medical record. The second thing is, I think that major media has done an incredible spin to put fear into the heart, even of physicians who should know better, to say, well, maybe, maybe the law doesn't really say that. 
And what I would suggest to those physicians is read your law. It's written in English. You can do this. You know, read the law. They're very explicit. The laws say things like this, what is banned are those procedures done deliberately to end the life of a human being for no medical reason. The law does not include miscarriage treatment, ectopic pregnancy treatment. That's what the laws say. They're explicit. So for, for a physician to say, well, I don't know if I can treat this, there's a bit of laziness on the part of that physician. Read the law in your state. It's not that hard. And, and I think that everybody has to go take a, a, take a breath because 85 to 93% of OBGYNs in this country did not do abortions in their practice. 85 to 93%. We all treated miscarriages. We all treated ectopics. We all separated moms and babies to save the mom's life, regardless of the baby's gestational age. And sometimes those babies did die. That is not an abortion. Okay. If there's a medical reason to separate the mom and the baby, that is not an abortion. So I think we have to take a breath and think very clearly about what is an abortion and what it is not. An abortion is a drugs or, a, or surgery or a procedure done with the primary purpose of producing a dead baby. That's the purpose of an abortion for no medical reason. If you're separating the mom and the baby in order to make sure that the mom can live, that's not an abortion. That's a separation done with the medical reason of trying to prevent two people from dying. Yes, we know the baby can die and probably will if the baby's less than 22 weeks. We still separate because if we don't separate, mom and baby die. So that's not an abortion. You know, an abortion is done. Again, I know I've said this, but I, I think it's important to repeat. An abortion yeah. is by definition, those drugs or devices or procedures that are done with the purpose of producing a dead baby. That's the primary purpose of an abortion. That makes sense. And I'm glad you say it again and again, because we need to hear it, because that's something that, you know, the, the, op, the, um, the media is spinning other stories and false beliefs that are, that we hear often. And so we need to have the truth highlighted. Um, so similar to, well, in several, there's been several stories of people not being able to get ectopic pregnancy care when they have an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and I'm wondering, are there any laws, pro-life laws or any laws in general that prevent medical care to someone with a topic pregnancy? Uh, because it seems like there's been people saying that these pro-life laws are preventing people from getting care, you know, life-saving care, or they're having to, their doctors are afraid to provide care or something like that <laughs> when there's an ectopic pregnancy. Well, it's ridiculous. I mean, again, I'm going to say to the doctors, to the patients, read the law. Okay. There is not a law in the country, not one single law in any place in the country that prevents a woman from getting ectopic pregnancy care. Not one single law in any place in the country, any state that prevents a woman from getting miscarriage care or from separating the mom and the baby to save the mom's life. Not one law anywhere. Ectopic pregnancy care has nothing to do with abortion. It's even a different procedure. You don't do a DNC to treat an ectopic. You do a surgery that opens up the abdomen, either you know, enough to get a laparoscope in or, or you know, maybe a, a, a bigger operation, depending on how big the ectopic is and where it's located, or they receive a medicine called methotrexate. But that's not abortion. Abortion is when you have an intrauterine pregnancy and you do a, you do a procedure to end that, that life. So when people are saying we couldn't get ectopic pregnancy care, that's malpractice. That's not, that has nothing to do with the law. That has to do with the, the person that you went to that, <laughs> that didn't do the right thing. So that's, that's malpractice. Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you spoke to that because that's, it just feels like these false beliefs need to be, um, well, when, there, when there's a false belief, it needs the truth to be, um, needs the truth to be promoted and shared in order to then dispel or to, de you know, remove the power of a false belief 
and to call it what it is, which is a lie or an un, you know not true and just simply false. Um, so when it comes to abortion pill reversal, um, mm -hmm. and in this new post row era, uh, can you talk about um, you know how APR and abortion pill reversal is you know wh how wh what's its role in this new post row era? Well, I'm really glad you asked that question because there's a lot of misunderstanding about abortion pill reversal too. What we know, we know exactly how the abortion drug Mifeprex works. The abortion drug Mifeprex works by blocking the pregnancy hormone progesterone. And progesterone is the hormone that the woman's body makes that allows her, to, her body to change and be able to carry and nourish a pregnancy. So Mifeprex comes in and it blocks the action of progesterone. It not only blocks the action, it actually blocks the ability of her body to make more progesterone. And when that happens, baby starves. Okay. But we also know something else from the drug development literature. That is when they were developing Mifeprex back in the 80s. There's all kinds of studies that you have to do to look at how this drug works. And part of the way they, they know how the drug works is they took Mifeprex, gave it to mice, and then they gave progesterone. Progesterone is the natural hormone that your body makes. And lo and behold, when they did that, the drugs that got just the Mifeprex, just the abortion drug, babies, mice babies all aborted. The drugs that got Mifeprex and progesterone, babies didn't abort. And they've also, in the drug development literature, they looked at how can this work on a molecular level? And they demonstrated clearly that in the presence of progesterone, progesterone can kick the mifeprex off of the progesterone receptor. And what that does is that rescues the ability of the woman's body to then care for her baby. But that progesterone, that extra progesterone that's gonna kick the mifeprex off the receptor, that progesterone has to be given within 72 hours. Why? Because after 72 hours of, of starving the baby, baby's going to be dead. Baby's not going to live. So in order to increase the chances that the baby survives, you want the progesterone around the sooner the better. So given within 72 hours, you can take the number of babies who survive Mifeprex poisoning, you can take it from 25%, so one out of five will survive the Mifeprex poisoning at the best if you don't give anything. And you can increase that to about 68% survive. It's not 100%. Okay, so there are some babies that even if you give progesterone, they're not going to live. They're not going to make it. But you can rescue a good percent of them. And there's over 3,000 babies now who are alive right now because of abortion pill reversal. So this is information that every woman needs and she needs to have it before she gets pregnant. Why? Because she's only got 72 hours after she takes that pill, that first pill, for her to be able to access the progesterone that can save her baby's life, that can increase the chances that her baby can live. That's amazing. So another question on APR is, um, Let's see, so, so critics of APR have claimed that the treatment is not based on rigorous studies and, that, <laughs> and even that it could, be a, it could be dangerous for women. Why are they saying those things and why are they wrong? Well, again, the abortion industry says lots of things that is pure marketing and pure spin and has nothing to do with reality. They are completely wrong because the drug development literature is very clear as to how Mifeprex works. And it's for a physician, it's like poisoning treatment 101, okay? Let me give you an analogy. If you are in your garage and you get carbon monoxide poisoning, we take you to the, to the hospital, what's the first thing that's done? You're given high-dose oxygen. Why? Because we know the carbon dioxide binds exactly the same place oxygen does, and we know oxygen can kick the carbon dioxide off of the, the, the red cell, off the hemoglobin, and you're rescued, okay? That's, that's poisoning an antidote. Mifeprex is a poison. 
It's a poison of the progesterone receptor. The antidote to that poison is progesterone. It's the natural antidote. And so it's, and it's such basic science. It's, it's like the first thing you learn in biochemistry. It's the first kind of things that you learn when you look at physiology. That is how your body works. So it's, it's well-based, in fact. In fact, so much so, there was a, um, when abortion pill reversal was first starting to get some uh, uh, press coverage, the New York Times did a story on it. And they, they ask an endocrinologist, Harvey Klingman, I think was his name, who's pro-choice, I, I guess. Um, they said, well, what do you think of this? And he said, well, probably work. My daughter was pregnant and had uh, somehow gotten some mifeprex. First thing I'd do is give her progesterone. A couple weeks, probably work. I'm sure that's not what the New York Times reporter was expecting to hear. But the fact is, it's simple. It's, it's basic physiology. So that's important for women to know. They need to know that, that there is hope if they've made a bad decision, if they've been pressured into taking that first pill, there's hope that they can rescue that baby and, and increase the chances that the baby survives. So Google abortion pill rescue or APR, and that's how you get the hotline to be connected with a, a um, medical professional who can prescribe progesterone for you and get you into prenatal care. Can you, can you speak to the, um, the problem when it comes to doing a, like a double blind study, when it comes to, you know, let's oh. say <laughs> half of the women um, yeah. take APR and half of them take a placebo, and when it comes to all of them wanting to save the life of their baby after taking the abortion pill, what would be the moral problem with well, a study like that? Well, the problem is these women want to save their baby. So if somebody were drowning, would we say, well, we're gonna do a study to see if uh, life preservers work or not. So half the women were going to throw out just a rope and the other half we're gonna throw out a life preserver and we're gonna see which ones survive. Is that an ethical study? No, of course not. And what, what is so galling to me is that in the development and in the study of Mifeprex, the abortion drug, there is not one single double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Why? Because the abortion industry said, if a woman wants an abortion, it would be unethical not to give her one. Mm. Not one single double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. And yet, when we know that this works because of animal models, because of basic physiology, because of understanding how Mifeprex works, and we know progesterone is safe. Progesterone has been used in the IVF industry for 50 years. There's recently been a very large national study looking at the use of progesterone, it's called the Prolong study, the use of progesterone in women with threatened miscarriages. We know progesterone's safe, we know it works, Every IVF patient is put on progesterone with no increase in complications. It's a natural hormone. So for people to say it's dangerous is, is again, it's hallucinatory. You know, I, I mean, these people are hallucinating or I should really actually say what it is. It's a marketing spin, it's fear mongering. So the study that's cited to say how dangerous mifeprex or, or progesterone is, the study that's cited, <laughs> this is so ridiculous, it was done by an abortionist, Mitchell Krinan, and he had a total of 10 patients that he could evaluate, 10, okay? Five of them got Mifeprex, the abortion drug, and then progesterone. The other five just got the abortion drug and a placebo, okay? So in the five that got Mifeprex plus progesterone, four out of five of them, 80% had a baby with a heartbeat at two weeks. One of them went to the ER for bleeding, but by the time she got to the ER, she passed all the tissues, so she was sent home with no treatment. Mm. That's the ones who got progesterone. The ones who got the abortion drug alone, Mifeprex, two of them, two out of the five, so 40%, had a baby with a heartbeat in two weeks. One of them ended up completely miscarrying, with, you know, complete, completing the abortion. Two of them went to the ER with massive hemorrhage. Both mm. of them had to have surgery to intervene, a DNC, and one of them had to be transfused. His study shows the opposite of what he said. The data from his yeah. study show how safe progesterone is after Mifeprex, and they show how dangerous it is 
to take Mifeprex. And I have to tell you something else about, about that. And that is in, their, in our study of all the adverse event reports that were submitted to the FDA, we looked at hemorrhage rates in women who took Mifeprex alone and in women who took Mifeprex and the second drug, mesoprostol, so the two drug regimen. The women who took the two drugs hemorrhaged at a higher rate than the women who took the Mifeprex alone. So you have, you have frankly, a lie in the Krinan study. And anybody who can look at numbers and read English can look and see and verify, don't believe me, pull the study. It says exactly what I said it says. And, and, and yet the authors of that study came to, wrote in their conclusions, something that had nothing to do with the data in the study. This is the kind of thing we're dealing with. We're dealing with, instead of science, we're dealing with marketing. And everything about abortion is marketing. Market to the women, make them believe things that aren't true, like safe and effective. And, and so it, you have to understand these people are out for a profit and they're profiting over your, your body. Wow. So, and it feels like when someone is, when someone is you know, proven to, you know, to lie repeatedly, that they're, you know, that they're ability to be an author in you know in the medical community would be greatly tarnished and that and the fact you know the the likelihood of them the next thing that they say you know should be you know the weight of their previous uh honesty or false belief promotion should heavily influence how they're looked at does that seem to be taking place when it comes to the abortion clinic and when they're caught promoting false beliefs and lies um, you know, spinning things. You know, why is that? Why is that not more prevalent when it comes to you know the weight as an author? Well, this comes more from this comes more from experience than anything else. When two and two makes up five, you're missing something. And I think, unfortunately, what we're missing is the huge amount of cash that's flowing to support the abortion industry, yeah. huge amounts. And so money talks and these people who have deliberately published things that are are clearly in error should not be able to publish but they are over and over so follow the money mm. wow thank you donna for yeah for your time and your just your for sharing of your your intellect and your wisdom and your experience
us light, give us vision, give us love, give us mission, give us courage, give us power, give us righteousness for this hour, give us joy, give us faith, give us life that we can taste, give us the cross. Jesus, give us you.